Welcome to the Retail Focus Podcast, a weekly collection of news, interviews, and information from the world of retail. Here are your hosts, Trent Kling and Leighton Kling. Welcome to this week's edition of the Retail Focus Podcast. I'm Trent Kling. He's Leighton Kling. We'll start out the show with a couple of quick stories, one from the grocery segment, one from the pharmacy segment. Later on in the show, we'll talk about the largest point-of-sale systems provider for retail stores in the U.S. We'll also discuss an e-commerce pure play announcing they are closing their proverbial doors this week. Our interview guests this week, there's two of them in one interview, Slow Mo Chop and Ryan Wolf of Shop Fulfill, who will be joining us to discuss Anchor Shops, which is a new brick-and-mortar retail concept and fulfillment mechanism for e-commerce pure play brands. They're looking at launching their first brick-and-mortar location in Philadelphia. They'll talk about that location and the nearby fulfillment center in New Jersey that is on mall. Some interesting stuff there. A reminder that you can like us and rate us however you access us. I was just told this week that we've had a, a number of ratings here in the last few weeks, so we appreciate those that listen in and like us or rate us if, again, you enjoy us or feel compelled or motivated to do so. And you can do that on any podcast platform, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podcast Addict, or even Blueberry. We're out there on just about all of them. Additionally, you can check us out on Instagram and Twitter at Retail Podcast. So again, we mentioned a couple of quick stories to lead off the show. Usually we do a deep dive to lead the show. Not this week. We're going to start with grocery retailer Hold Delays as they showcased positive fourth quarter earnings this week. Driven by a few surprises. Now, the earnings aren't as much of an interest to us because, again, we're talking about a company that is based internationally. We're looking more at trends they've got going on for their U.S. grocers. And, again, you're looking at brands like Food Lion, Stop and Shop, Giant, Hannaford, and so forth underneath this banner. The surprise to us, at least, was the success of Food Lion in the fourth quarter. We talked on the show last year. I actually visited multiple Food Lions in the Mid-Atlantic when I was traveling out there. Noted most of them had an old and outdated feel to them with a fraction of the customers that neighboring grocery chains had. Still, that fraction enough to drive sales up, apparently, at Food Lion. We should mention that not all sales for a hold delays come from the United States, but a substantial portion at least do. About two-thirds of their business does, however, even though they are not a U.S.-based company. As such, many of their financial numbers are in euros rather than dollars. And for reference, the current euro exchange rate to the U.S. dollar is about $1.08 U.S. dollars. And you see that the dollar has gotten stronger against the euro as of late, allowing for gains in net income and revenue for the company with that currency translation. Operating income rose about 3% versus last year's fourth quarter. And overall sales rose about 5.5% owing largely to the improved exchange rate. So you see here, CEO Franz Mueller said that the results are in line with the consensus estimates and that the company was fairly happy with them overall. And we say consensus estimates, we're talking about the guidance for the company. Their comparable store sales grew 2.3% in the United States, excluding currency impacts. This is truly remarkable, and this outpaces inflation and puts them just behind category leaders like Publix, and Kroger, the latter of which, by the way, posted 2.5% increases in comps in the most recent quarter. They credited in-store operations, but also digital sales, which jumped up by 42.7%. Their U.S. divisions like Stop and Shop, Giant, Hannaford, and the aforementioned Food Lion had largely been seen as being behind Kroger and Walmart in digital advances. However, these numbers suggest they are in fact, catching up with $1.1 billion in sales overall in the U.S. coming from digital channels during the last fiscal year. You see they are aiming for growth to pull back slightly as their digital businesses really reach adolescence and with projected online growth of 30% for the 2020 year, still not a bad number to aim for. Mueller said that they view this growth coming organically rather than through additional capabilities being added to their current network. Food Line and Hannaford were the stars in the U.S. sales as the company said their stop and shop division was still negative in year-over-year comp sales. They did grow sequentially, Mueller noted, but that's not really too much worth writing home about. To effort to assist stop and shop, they continue an aggressive revitalization program called 
reimagine Stop and Shop. They anticipate 65 Stop and Shop remodels in the 2020 fiscal year. While most of the call was positive, just afterwards, a whole delays announced the closure of the Midwest division of Peapod. Yeah, to give you a little bit of background there, Peapod is an online grocery sales business that is independent from their other grocery brands in the U.S. And in fact, Peapod is one of the older online grocery sales businesses. You look nearly 30 years in business, although not always online, it should be noted, but still a wealth of experience in the e-commerce grocery space, more so than perhaps any other outfit in the U.S., they were initially acquired by a hold delays all the way back in 2000, so 20 years ago. But one thing I would caution to note, Peapod is not completely shutting down, so it is remaining in place for much of the eastern U.S., but it is ending service for customers in Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana on February 18th, so right around the corner. Might have already passed, depending on the time. You listen to this podcast. With the closure comes their closures of three distribution centers as well, one in each of the states, Illinois, Wisconsin, and Indiana. These closures were planned prior, of course, to the earnings call for hold delays. So no impact to that online growth goal that Layton was talking about of 30% for their U.S. division in 2020. But it does suggest that the company as a whole would rather focus on the eastern U.S. Makes sense. That's where the balance of their other grocery operations exist. Oddly enough, though, and we found this kind of interesting, Chicago is going to remain the headquarters for Peapod Digital Labs, so kind of a subsidiary there, research and development, even though they'll no longer be servicing that area. So the company will still exist there as far as that kind of micro headquarters is concerned. Ultimately, you look, this is terrible news for the approximately 500 employees affected, but it is a natural consequence in digital grocery and honestly follows a similar trend to the meal prep kit explosion we saw a few years ago. While Peapod predated others' entry to digital grocery sales, it's not like they're a Johnny Come Lately or anything like that or a VC backed startup. Companies are increasingly finding it more expedient to use their own brands for digital grocery. You look at, obviously, Kroger's click list, but a whole delays has a number of those digital platforms here in the United States, and they're all branded under the individual grocery outlets that end up fulfilling those orders under Stop and Shop or Giant or Food Lion, you don't see it branded under a third party or anything of that nature. And I think grocers are finding it more expedient to use their own brands for digital grocery, just like it's more expedient to use their own brands for meal prep kits. We talked a couple of years ago how we kind of foresaw this gradual consolidation and eventually elimination of the cottage industry for meal prep kits as buyouts took place, but also you have brands like Albertsons and Safeway, Kroger, who have found over the last several years that as popularity of these meal prep kits begins to wane, it becomes more pertinent for them to bring it under their own brand structure. So I think you're kind of seeing that effect here with Peapod. So not only is Hold Delays able to say, hey, we're going to kind of cut out our geographical footprint. We might save some more money in that direction. Peapod wasn't really generating a lot of revenue in those three particular states and certainly wasn't generating the profit that a hold delays wanted to see. But at the same time, they're able to say, hey, let's focus on our wheelhouse and also focus on those organic e-commerce solutions. And by organic, we don't necessarily mean organic like organic produce, but growing those solutions from within using their current grocery brands. And I think that's what you're going to start seeing more of from a hold delays as they move forward. Well, we mentioned a couple of quick stories to start the show. Hold delays was one. We have to talk about CVS after their earnings call showed more consistent growth in their retail channels. For CVS, this was for their fiscal fourth quarter. We've always been interested in the growth patterns for CVS as it really has come mostly from pharmacy rather than front of store in the last few years. However, unlike their chief rivals in Walgreens and to a lesser extent Rite Aid, CVS has actually seen periodic quarters of front of store comp growth and we saw that again in this fourth quarter. Company-wide, they were able to beat adjusted earnings per share estimates by around five cents per share with analysts expecting $1.68 per share and CVS coming in at around $1.73 per share. Of course, that includes their pharmacy services and, of course, the Aetna segments in which they 
they purchased recently, where we are more interested here in the retail segment. The retail segment revenue for them was up over last year's fourth quarter by around 2.5%. However, operating income did fall by 4.4%. Not good, but also not unexpected with an increased number of generics hitting the market there. A lot of generics really coming in. And in fact, their generic dispensing rate in their retail pharmacies increased by 80 basis points to 87.5% in the fourth quarter versus the fourth quarter of last year, something that a lot of major media outlets have been covering as of late with drug prices slowly coming down in a number of drug sectors. For CVS, the generic dispensing rate speaks to how many prescriptions are being filled with generics at the same time while their margins are struggling they are bringing in more scripts on both a raw dollar basis and also on a numerical basis with scripts filled popping 5.6 percent over last year the number we're always interested in though was cvs comp sales for the pharmacy it was good up 4.1 percent assisted by a 6.9 percent increase in script volume They now have 26.8% of the prescription market share in the U.S. Front of store sales were up. They increased 0.7%, slightly behind inflation, of course, for this segment, but still better than being negative overall. I'm sure executives were thrilled about this. They once again credited strength in HBA sales, as Rite and Walgreens have done both recently for the increase. Additionally, they saw specific year-over-year increases in cough and cold sales. It's too early to tell at this point why this is, but it could be from an earlier onset to cold season than last year and is worth keeping an eye on for other retailers over the next few weeks. And what's more interesting trend is that during the reveal of the 2020 guidance, CVS actually noted that front of store could be more of a positive for them. They did. They expect 1% to 2.5% increase in total revenues across the entire retail segment, so that includes pharmacy and front of store. But they said specifically that front store is expected to drive increased results on the operating income front, basically saying it's going to help us in margins where we're kind of losing those margins on the pharmacy side because of all these pressures. Pressures from generics, pressures from reimbursements. Specifically, they think health and beauty will once again be a major driver for them. To that end, they actually mention in the Q&A section on the call that they're working to reposition the front store from a marketing standpoint, but also a merchandising standpoint to drive more focus on health and beauty. And you would look at that and say, well, health and beauty is the majority of what they sell on the front store front. But the implied statement here, although they didn't mention it specifically, is that they're going to seek to perhaps pivot slightly from food and grocery in front store and some of the other revenues that that front store offers. Food nor grocery was mentioned even once. The entire call, even when analysts asked for color on those front store expectations and guidance. And it's kind of interesting because you see these partnerships floating around with Walgreens regarding their partnership with Kroger. And you might say, well, that's a sign that they're shifting away internally from food and grocery. But the bottom line is Walgreens really looking to kind of boost their presence in terms of food and grocery, where CVS honestly wasn't really mentioned a whole lot on this particular earnings call. It wasn't mentioned at all on this particular earnings call. And I think pharmacy, you know, it drives top line. You're seeing more single digit growth in prescriptions filled. They expect more of the same in 2020, but it's also expected to provide more pressure on that bottom line because of that reimbursement pressure that you're seeing. Also, essentially, CVS on the call alluded to the fact that front store is still absolutely critical for them. It's not at all ignored because although pharmacy sales make up a greater percentage of revenue than ever before, margins are far greater in front of store because of these pressures. So it's really something key to note. If front of store sees even incremental growth for them, which again is what's kind of expected, they could produce far more benefit to the bottom line than substantial pharmacy growth even could. All of this, by the way, is taking place as they continue to build out their health hubs with around 600 more planned in retail stores in 2020. Nothing new on that front really to speak of. 
But you look, and even as their competitors, we're talking Rite Aid, we're talking Walgreens, are building out this, or attempting to build out the front of store, and are talking much more about food and grocery, it's CVS that's actually having the success in this area. So kind of an interesting dynamic there for CVS as a whole, and one of the reasons why we're always so intrigued to talk about their earnings calls and their updates. Now it's time for the interview segment of the show. After this break, our interview guests will join us, Shlomo Chop and Ryan Wolf, once again of Shop Fulfill, who will join us to discuss their new Anchor Shops concepts as well as their fulfillment concepts surrounding it. So we talked about two retail companies in the opening of the show and Hold Delays and CVS that are well established, but... What about companies that are just starting? What about endeavors or enterprises that are just starting? Well, there's a wonderful new podcast that just came out. It's honestly climbed the podcast charts very quickly into the top 15. It's a unique show that kind of you don't see out there a whole lot. It's an experienced entrepreneur who takes people from all walks of life and mentors them, teaching them how to make money starting from zero. The podcast has 50% female participants on the episodes. He has over 15 millionaire students, and it definitely shows. The episodes are highly edited for maximum impact, and it's as good as they come, truly. I think the coolest thing about it is these people, they don't have to compromise who they are to be mentored. If you'd like to try out an episode or maybe binge it to see if you like it, Visit startfromzero.com slash retail. Once again, startfromzero.com slash retail. As we've seen many e-commerce pure plays and lifestyle brands begin to mature over the last few years, many have been searching for mechanisms to stake out a place in the brick and mortar realm. There have been a handful of available solutions to that end, but one that was recently announced by Shop Fulfill has a great deal of promise. The concept is called Anchor Shops, and joining us to discuss Anchor Shops as well as a new fulfillment center for Shop Fulfill are Slow Mo Chop and Ryan Wolf, both co-founders of Shop Fulfill. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us today. Thank you so much. Pleasure to join you. So first, we'll kind of start here. Where did the concept for Anchor Shops have its genesis? And I was wondering also if you could discuss kind of at a high level for our audience what the concept is about. So this is Shlomo, and I'll give you a little background as to how it came about, and I'll let Ryan dig in on the concept itself. So my background is in commercial real estate as a start. I started out my career actually in prop tech before it was prop tech when people still had their Palm Pilots. And then I transitioned over into commercial real estate, investments, et cetera. And I was looking at various investments. And on the industrial side, investing in industrial real estate was really not attractive because rents have gone up and values have gone up and it's dependent on a lot of e-commerce fulfillment. And that sector has yet to really realize profitability. So there's underlying credit issue. And then on the retail side, to buy retail properties, which we own and just like we own industrial, but to look at new properties, just the cost of putting a tenant in there compared to the credit of that tenant is just really prohibitive from a real estate ownership perspective. So we just didn't feel comfortable spending all that money putting tenants in. So I said, there's got to be a really new way to go from being a real estate owner where you rent lease lines, where you rent the space to someone, as opposed to actually giving them the service and everything they need to succeed. And that's how Anchor Shops and Shop Fulfill came about. Shop Fulfill was the parent company and the infrastructure and Anchor Shops is a consumer facing experience. And then Ryan on board, Ryan's got a background in consumer space. I'll let him talk about that, but help develop out the retail component that really brings this experiential nature plus the convenience of the underlying infrastructure to be able to make this all tick. Yeah, I mean, I, there's probably a lot of parallel to what Shlomo was talking about. My background, you know, predominantly over the last 25 years is broad and diverse with a lot of general management experiences in retail, digital commerce, merchandising, brand, product, inventory, international, etc. But, you know, I had an inflection point in my career having worked for one of the largest global apparel brands for the better part of 18 years and transformed the last seven, eight years into working with earlier stage consumer, consumer tech brands and clearly saw the problem, which was a couple fold. Number one is that the sustainability of being a pure play DTC e-commerce channeled business 
was probably good for a lot of reasons over the years, but the viability of how it grows is certainly going to become turbulent. And on the other hand, I saw a lot of the friction and a lot of travesty and challenges that people face in terms of trying to translate their business from a single channel digital commerce business to a multi-channel retail business. And there's a lot of friction and challenges. And actually, I'm going to add a third point here, which is that one thing that really grabbed my attention is that pre-digital era, consumer loyalty, brand discovery, and that whole cultivation of kind of identifying and aligning yourself with brands and products that you love was always done through maybe a vacation or a trip to New York City or to a mall or to some sort of place where you found those brands. And today, that paradigm has been completely flipped on its head such that it's all done online. And what's interesting about that through social, through content, through various other things that we engage and interact with in the digital world is that a lot of brand loyalty in large part is discovered online. But those brands rarely are found in malls or in premier shopping areas around the country. And this then lies the opportunity and perhaps maybe the problem. So I want to kind of piggyback off of that. You know, as I mentioned in the intro, we've seen a few different solutions kind of pop up for e-commerce pure plays to get their entry into the brick and mortar space. But I wanted to kind of ask you what sets the anchor shops concept apart from the other ones that we've seen in the past? So there are several challenges with the current solutions out there that I think we address. And the first one is once you set up a store and you spend all that money at merchandising and building out a beautiful experience, you get someone in the store and they don't have product to take home. Now the challenge with that is really infrastructure. How do you have a proper supply chain to be able to allow the shopper not to have to go home and charge you for shipping probably both ways because they're probably not going to get what they thought they're going to get. So that's the first solution we solve. Another thing that we solve is that e-commerce, you know, has this transportation challenges where it costs a lot of money to send something cross country. And if you were to use a localization strategy where you could pre-position stock in every market, then you could cut the cost of transportation drastically. Now the problems with pre-positioning stock if you're a normal e-commerce brand is that what if you position too much stock in a market you end up with stranded products and therefore lose money, not only because you don't sell it and time is money, but also you got to send it back to where it will sell. What we do is allow you to sell through two channels on a localized basis. So we maximize your ability to sell. And the third thing, more than anything else that we do, and Ryan can really touch on this, is that we find in a lot of these retail and service models, purchasing is not encouraged, right? It's all about discovery, which is great. But discovery without leading to a purchase, is not retailing. It's a museum, it's an amusement park, and that's great if that's the business you want to be in. I would also add, I think for the people that have endeavored out into the retail as a service space, I mean, by and large, from just an experiential standpoint in terms of visual merchandising and installation, there's a lot of people that have done a lot of really great things. I, I think we fundamentally think of it different, of a different proposition and one that separates itself from being a purveyor of space and sort of beautiful installations to just being a purveyor of product and brands and product and brands that are rooted in discovery. And I think to me, that then sort of segues into a consumer experience that they can identify with us that is unique and that it's ongoing. And as an example, rather than just having a digital native or emerging branded product in the cosmetics, beauty or skincare space, we, we sort of think about this as an opportunity to build an experience in a department that is rooted in clean beauty and cosmetics. And that's our identity and that's our point of view. And that's what we want to be known for. So our connection with the customer, we're engineering this to be much more in the forefront of connectivity on what can they count on us for, what types of brands and products that define the experience much more so than really great installations certainly both play an important role but that's how we like to think that we have a differentiated proposition and of course all of which complemented with a regional micro fulfillment solution that immediately from day one adds value to these brands is an important aspect i wanted to touch a little bit more on that fulfillment aspect because you know with a standard retailer buy online pickup and store part of the brick and mortar presence certainly 
But it's a little bit different. Like if you're Best Buy, let's say you go online to bestbuy.com, place an order, it's ready for pickup in the store, but you're really just dealing with the single retailer, the single brand. What was different as you were setting up this buy online pickup in store platform that you've got and that you'd like to scale in terms of addressing and making sure that all of the brands and all of these retailers' needs are met? So at the core of our strategy is a stock localization strategy, which also means that you could use the same pool of stock for online and offline purchases which is something that on a retail side, forget about the e-commerce side, that's not integrated into stores, but even on the retail side, consider the holy grail of retailing to be able not to have to double up your stock. So what we do is we actually locate enough stock to fulfill e-commerce within a region. Just to give you a sense, in our first region, where we have our fulfillment center in most town, New Jersey, we could fulfill next day for the price of ground from as high up as the Hudson Valley in New York, to down to the North Carolina, Virginia border. So that is a huge swath of space. And that e-commerce fulfillment, when you localize product for that e-commerce fulfillment, you have a, a significant amount of product, almost an endless aisle, in a nearby fulfillment center. Using the same regional strategy for stores, replenishing the stock in stores is just a matter of ongoing milk runs. So you could keep your store very low stock and still be able to provide all the products that the shoppers need in store and at the same time, be able to fulfill online orders from a fulfillment center and from a normal fulfillment infrastructure. So you're not shipping from shelf and all the inconveniences that come with that. And you have all that product. So, so how does it differentiate from buy online, pick up in store? Well, you could buy online and pick up a fulfillment center. And that fulfillment center, it's on mall. So you're not going out to some industrial park far away. It's literally a little drive for you and you go into your local mall and you have the unlimited stock nearby. So for retailers, that's a massive benefit. For e-commerce brands, it's out of this park. Yeah, I think what's also unique about this is that there's actually more similarity than there is difference. And when I read some of the public commentary from the CEO of Target and how they're establishing this use case of using their stock rooms to do localized fulfillments, and having their product more accessible and, and quite frankly, increasing the utility of having that product in their stockroom to service local demand. And the results of that, which are profoundly positive, is that we're just enabling a leveraged infrastructure for brands that maybe don't have $10 billion worth of established infrastructure that they developed over the last 30 years. And we're providing the opportunity to tap that value, similar to what they're doing, for being just an emerging digital native brand that's trying to find its way out into the world. So circling back to that fulfillment center, I did want to touch on that just a little bit because as you mentioned, Shlomo, it is a public facing fulfillment center and those are fairly rare in the retail world. Given that, what were some special considerations that went into developing that? Because as you mentioned, on mall, it's kind of a different idea behind a fulfillment center than what you typically see. Yes, that's 100% correct. And part of the reason why we're on mall is because eventually we add a shop to the front of that fulfillment center and you actually have a super center with all the stock that you could ever have on site in a retail store, but yet you retail shops on micro shops, just like the fulfillment is technically micro fulfillment. Now with locating the fulfillment center, it's important that number one, you can get there accessibly via truck, but you could also get there accessibly via car. You have proper loading capacity. We also have the proper access for a shopper to go and not feel like they're going to industrial park. So by putting it on mall, surrounded by other services. So if you take a look at some other concepts out there, like, you know, happy returns, they're essentially doing a tiny fulfillment center within a mall. We're actually taking it to the next step by not only handling returns, we're handling fulfillment and all those other aspects as well. So while this is a pretty unique concept, it's actually not unheard of and it's actually being used right now. Now, the question is, with all this empty big box space in malls, what do you do with it? And using a micro fulfillment strategy that actually enables your brand to grow and enables you to actually get more brands into your retail store because now they actually could sell product in the store. So while it may at first blush seem as if you're taking retail space and turning it into industrial, and why would you do that? Actually, you're making the retail space more valuable by having the nearby fulfillment components as well. 
So I wanted to look back at the Anchor Shops location in downtown Philadelphia. And I know, Shlomo, you mentioned real estate background. So you probably do location selection or you could do it in your sleep. But what went into your selection of that first location there in downtown Philadelphia? That's a great question. Thank you. So essentially, we look at retail and the fulfillment center as being two parts of one whole. So it's not as much about the retail location alone, but it's the retail location combined with the fulfillment location as well, because they have to be nearby to enable the ongoing stock replenishment, the buy online, pick up in store, etc. So what we see in the South Jersey Philly market from an e-commerce fulfillment perspective is this wide swath, as I said, you can fill up from the Hudson Valley down to the North Carolina border from an e-commerce perspective. And that is a huge chunk of the population. So that's first off. Now, Philly as a market is a really dynamic market. It's the sixth largest MSA in the country. And as a property, this property is located near colleges. The property is located near tourist attractions. It's located near a convention center. It's located near high-rise office buildings. And our specific shop is literally yards from the entranceway to a 22 million passenger a year train station. So when people come downtown to Philly to work, to visit, to go to school, very often they pass right by our shop. And that was an opportunity that was just a combination of fulfillment and the store that was really too hard to pass up. Furthermore, you know, in any retail relationship, you sort of get married to your landlord. And in our case, free Pennsylvania Real Estate Trust, they got what we're doing, and I can tell you there are many real estate owners that really do not. You know, what we are doing is actually instead of looking at real estate as lease lines, instead of looking at real estate as here's your box, do what you got to do with it, don't bother us. Our model is here's your box, here's your design, here's your payroll, here's your tech. It's turnkey, literally, you know, within hours, days, or however long it's going to take you to get into our system, which is totally non-invasive into your usual operations, we have you up and running. So to have a landlord that recognizes our model as being the next step, it takes humility and it takes aggressiveness to sort of say, how is retail changing? How do we make our portfolio more responsive? And that was really key to our decision-making in locating our first location in downtown Philadelphia. And so to kind of close out, I wanted to talk about the next step, if you will, for anchor shops here. I know there are plans to scale nationally with the concept, but I also know that we can't go super in depth with the details as with anything in the planning stage. But we've talked a little bit about what makes a market work, what makes something go for you, but what's the timeline you're looking at as far as scaling and what are some of the markets you feel work best with the concept? Is it about that quick shipping time that we were discussing? Is it about that retail presence? What makes a good market for your concept? This is Ryan. So, you know, my take on this is that, you know, there's going to be plenty of markets that would be very relevant where people have a really great retail presence for us. I think for us on the horizon, the next 24 to 36 months is to not just have a complementary strategy of some of the top markets, where digital native and emerging brands have a high priority on where they would like to have a premier retail location, but also larger markets that in turn provide the ability for us to expand one day delivery with micro fulfillment options within that region. To me, the goal and the aspiration is getting this model as quickly as possible to being able to deliver 70% of the United States one day delivery complemented with a premier retail presence in these markets is an incredible and fantastic value proposition for these digital native brands to take the next step into endeavoring into a multi-channel business. All right, so once again, Shlomo Chop and Ryan Wolf, both co-founders of Shop Fulfilled, discussing Anchor Shops on the show today. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much for having us. Once again, we thank Shlomo and Ryan for joining us here on the podcast. If you want to check out more about Anchor Shops and some of the concepts surrounding Anchor Shops, you can check them out at anchorshops.com. Makes sense, but they've got a number of pictures on there that'll kind of illustrate exactly what you're looking at when you walk in to those stores. Now, we're going to take it on an interesting direction for the second half of the podcast from a news perspective. 
It's an update on the largest point of sale systems provider in the U.S. NCR released their earnings on Tuesday, February 11th. Analyst expectations for the quarter were in line with the company's results last year at 84 cents per share. They did post a slight beat of 85 cents per share. But the reason we're looking at this call, it's the end of the year for NCR, and we wanted to look at a few initiatives they discussed at this year's NRF that they kind of talked about in greater detail on this particular call. First, we'll dive into a little bit about NCR. Not all of what NCR does is actually tied to retail, but a large portion of it is. They have been generally or gradually increasing their banking and payment processing services, allowing them to continue to build revenue outside brick and mortar avenues. Still though, their retail business produced around 32% of their revenue in the fourth quarter. And to that point, NCR is the number one global point of sale provider for retail and hospitality industries. Part of their success in this space is really having been the first of the scene. Many years ago is when they started really dealing with retailers up front. And Trent, I know many of the retailers that you've worked for in the past deal with NCR, mine as well. So they are no stranger to this industry. They are credited with inventing the first ever, in fact, electronic cash register. As such, many retailers have developed solutions in tandem with NCR and are now in too deep to where it would require a lot of cost and human capital to switch providers, which will come into play later on this story. If you look at the results for this most latest quarter, you see these results for, like with the other retailers, their fiscal fourth quarter, meaning they come along with the full year results. On a constant currency basis, their fourth quarter revenue was up 6% year over year. This was due in large part to their continued emphasis on payments processing, which, as we've touched on in the past, is a way that many point-of-sale operators aim to increase revenue. Services revenue for them was up 7% as well. By the way, their piece of the retail point-of-sale pie has slowly been increasing, and it showed in their revenue generated by retail in the fourth quarter. They saw a 10% jump in revenue from retail-specific sources in the quarter. This was fueled by what else? Point of sale hardware, for which revenue was up a whopping 11% in the quarter. Payments processing is an increasingly lucrative business with more customers turning towards digital payments, although perhaps not as quickly as some pundits expected with around half of U.S. adults preferring to pay for purchases under $10 still with cash. These types of payments generally carry with them higher margins for payment processors owing to those per swipe fees. And we'll talk about some of the pullbacks here now as far as NCR is concerned. It sounded like some members of the Houston Astros were in the background there while Leighton was recording that last segment. I think a slider's coming up next, sports reference. As solid as their fourth quarter was for NCR, you look at sequential growth, bit of a pullback, their overall revenue for fiscal 2019 ending December 31st, 2019 was up 10% on a constant currency basis. Some of the slowing of growth was fueled by a reduction in the demand for ATMs, which makes sense. The more retail operators that are accepting cards, the less you actually need those ATMs around. Now, it was actually a better than expected quarter for ATMs, but still down over last year. And you're seeing significant reductions given time because, again, businesses more likely to accept cards. Now, looking at their retail revenue growth on a more granular basis, retailers need for more cashierless services. That was a major driver. They saw a benefit from payments and services revenue in the retail segment, but also major growth in their sales of checkout systems or self-checkout systems. NCR is, you could make the argument, they're the largest purveyor of self-checkout systems in the U.S. I think the numbers certainly bear that out. So it's no surprise that as we see retailers, particularly those in grocery and general merchandise, install more of these systems, NCR is benefiting. They saw 21% year-over-year increases in operating income for their self-checkout segment in the fourth quarter, basically saying that, hey, this year's fourth quarter, they sold 21% more of these systems than they did in last year's fourth quarter. And that really helped to bolster what ended up being an 11% gain for the full year. Leighton talked about those full year results coming out, gained 11% from 2018 to 2019 in the self-checkout segments. And it's not just new systems. As we've talked about, You know, we've seen Safeway and Albertsons 
really invest in some of these self-checkout systems, and it's about time. They're kind of updating some of their stores that needed updating on that front. But some retailers are actually updating the systems using newer systems than maybe the first or second generation systems than they had in stores. They're not just buying them for the first time. The new systems, some of them carry that scan and go optionality, the ability to work seamlessly with mobile devices and apps that previous generations of those systems lacked. Those new systems are important, though, because NCR is in the midst of a shift between just being a hardware supplier and selling the hardware to these companies to being more of a services provider, if you will. So as these companies update their self-checkout systems, this enables NCR to capitalize because they did underscore on the call the long-term need to shift to more of a service model to ensure a constant revenue stream through rental and service agreements. This is something that some retailers already contract with NCR to do, particularly those with the newest generation of self-checkout machines. And for those that are familiar with an office or business setting, this is similar to rentals of copiers and other large machines that you see. They want to aim for future revenue to be derived 60% from recurring sources. And you might ask why we're talking about this on a retail podcast since it seems to be more of a financial aspect to NCR, but it may not be an ideal switch for retailers who want to buy and hold machines for long periods of time. For example, Kmart still have the same point of sale systems they did in 2001. They haven't really changed in terms of that hardware. And as the last example might suggest in Kmart, this switch to services revenue may have the unintended consequence of squeezing struggling retailers even further. For this reason, we'd kind of wager that NCR would be a little bit more selective. They wouldn't force retailers necessarily into this model, but they're going to push it pretty hard upon those renewals and new buys and updates that you're seeing. NCR, at least though, has product lines to back up this shift. Uh, Just for those that deal with Adobe Creative Suite, Adobe switched to this type of model several years back and there weren't really any new products to accompany it. It was just a matter of getting money from you on a yearly basis instead of on a one-time basis. But NCR, cool thing about them is they just demoed their new Emerald cloud-based point-of-sale system at NRF last month to positive reviews. One of the big reasons why we wanted to check in on this earnings call, their first Emerald client, or so NCR CEO Mike Hayford boasted, they went from contract to operational in less than six months. They feel as though... They have a bit of a competitive moat because of this Emerald operating system, but also in point of sale technology as a whole, as far as how they've been able to integrate the cloud technology into Emerald. Hayford said on the call, and I quote, we don't see anyone else claiming the mantle as far as it pertains to those cloud-based point of sale systems. Overall, their theme was that bundling their solutions together has proved popular for both current and new clients. We're not just talking about those subscription services that we were kind of referencing with point of sale, but clients seem to be at least somewhat interested in combining their point of sale systems with banking solutions that are also provided by NCR, as well as ATM products when needed. And overall, I kind of think this shift to being a service-based company is going to be interesting, especially as renewals come up for some of their major clients. And this is kind of a combination looking at NCR now, but also looking ahead and where point-of-sale systems are going in this industry. Will retailers begin to report point-of-sale systems as an increasing expense because they're going to see recurring expenses on their balance sheet as this shift occurs? We mentioned early on, NCR has seen the success it has in large part because a lot of retailers are in very deep with them. NCR software and hardware is integrated into the very fabric of the IT for retailers that they serve, so it makes it difficult to switch and they kind of know it. They they have a captive market. They realize it. They appear to be aiming to take advantage. But while it's to NCR's benefit, might be to the financial disadvantage of some of the retailers that are closely tied in with NCR. In e-commerce pure play, we've discussed a few times on the podcast and interviewed their former co-founder, by the way, Shutters This Week. We're talking about Brandless, whose goal was to bring clean food and beauty products to the marketplace with most under a $3 price point. 
A big shout out to Mike with Dead and Dying Retail for bringing this to our attention this week. By the way, if you haven't already, check out their Facebook page there. It is hands down our favorite retail-based social media presence. And if you see, the story here has to do with the closure, which was, by the way, abrupt with no on-website liquidation, which is generally what we see with e-commerce pure plays. It will be interesting to note if brandless products happen to show up on the off-price market at an Ollie's bargain outlet, maybe at a Big Lots, for example. A note on their website this week read, after more than two amazing years of bringing customers across the country better for you and better for the planet products, Brandless is halting operations. While the Brandless team set a new bar for the types of products consumers deserve and at prices they expect, the fearlessly competitive direct-to-consumer market has proven unsustainable for our current business model. This comes back to the crux of what we've seen time and time again E-commerce pure play brands being unable to draw support independently to buoy operations. You see on paper, there was no reason why their model could not or should not have worked to drive revenue, especially given the low price point of the products and the free shipping, by the way, on orders over $35. However, the very things that made brandless appealing from a consumer perspective also likely played a part in making their business untenable from a margin perspective, given that shipping costs are estimated to average 7 to $8 per package through the main shipping providers, households that ordered $35 of merchandise at a time already limited potential profits on the products just given that shipping dynamic. And given the price point of the products to begin with, we suspect that their margins were essentially non-existent, which again is why we always have to argue against the idea of e-commerce lifestyle brands or non-brands in this case taking over and e-commerce is expensive and unless you have massive scale it is difficult to generate positive margin consistently the other aspect of it and that we may suspect many vc backed e-commerce direct to consumer pure plays are in the same boat losing large sums of money but because they are private no one really talks about their bottom line and the media just chases the shiny image instead. However, there is no doubting Brandless's impact on their customers. Ordinarily, we would find this blown out of proportion, but there are third-party sellers on Amazon marketing Brandless goods for easily twice the original retail price. Interestingly enough, Brandless's own Amazon presence, or at least what appears to be their Amazon presence, is still live as of Wednesday the 12th. You know, Leighton, there were signs of unrest among company leaders punctuated by Sharky leaving the company back in 2019, back in March. At the time, Brandless, again, just over two years old, the departure raised eyebrows among media outlets familiar with the company. But, you know, as we discussed when we had Sharky on the show, she is very effective at starting companies and so very highly motivated. And maybe it was just perhaps time for her to move on to the next thing. Some people would call her a serial entrepreneur, but really you talk to her and you get the sense of just someone that is so brimming with ideas that that's a potential (laughs) to happen with the company is, hey, got this started up. Now I'm going to move on to kind of the next enterprise that I want to look at. Meanwhile, John Rittenhouse, formerly of Walmart, took over Sharky's position. While this was happening, there were issues reported by Business Insider of SoftBank, which was a major funding source at the time of startup for them, potentially withholding $100 million in funding if Brandless did not meet financial targets. So you have turnover at the top, you have potential funding issues as far as that funding coming in. At Age, actually, there was an article there about the closure of Brandless. It cited Rittenhouse's LinkedIn page as showing him having left Brandless in December The statement that was on the website that Leighton discussed and also the statement issued from Brandless about their closure quoted CEO Evan Price, who was formerly their CFO. Put shortly, if you have three CEOs in less than a year, things are probably not good for you as a retailer. Now, the company's selection had gradually grown, launching with just 110 products in 2017. You had HBA products, you had food products, but most of the recent product build out was really in HBA rather than food. And so because of that, you changed the overall vision of the company and the site, which also sold things like cleaning products, for example, other household products, pet products were also added to the site in 2019, which was seen as an opportunity for Brandless to encroach on the ever-growing expenditures on pet products 
in the U.S. We've talked about that ad nauseum. Shoot, Layton's even turned our Twitter account at Retail Podcast into a personal Twitter page for his cat at some points. But overall, you see the reaction to this, and I think it's pretty varied because some people said, well, it's a margin issue. That's, I think, the camp that we're firmly in is... I don't think it's sustainable to make money when you're charging one to three dollars per product, shipping these things off, free shipping at thirty five dollars, shipping costing seven to eight dollars per package. Not going to be a super high margin business when all is said and done, you're going to need to do a massive amount of fulfillment and a massive amount of revenue to make any money on that. That just wasn't happening in this case. There were a few other people that said, hey, it might have been other issues. Mike Duda was quoted in the Ad Age article. He's a founder and managing partner at Bullish. He said basically they got too much money too quickly, uh, especially from SoftBank. He said they probably gave him more money than they needed, and that might have eroded operations in some way because they grew too fast too quickly. Nick Sharma, who is Forbes 30 under 30 professional consumer strategist, also an investor in direct to consumer companies. He actually came out and said people might have been suspicious of the price point, getting organic products at less than $3, natural organics products. I don't know that that was necessarily the case either, because you look and Nick, you know, credit to him, you know, certainly, like I mentioned, deserving of the Forbes 30 under 30, all of that. However, when you look at this, I think you might be suspect of that if you lived in New York. But other areas of the country are very used to getting natural and organics products at these price points now. When you look at the Midwest, you look at the Great Plains, you look even at the West Coast where Layton's at. If you go to a Ralph's or a Vaughn's there, you're going to see a lot of private label products, whether they be cleaning products, whether they be HBA products, whether they be food products, at or around that $3 price point. So I don't necessarily buy the fact that there was consumer suspicion there necessarily. But I do buy the fact that It is difficult for any direct-to-consumer company that's starting up, even if you have someone who is as popular as what Brandless was throughout the time of their existence, to make a go of it. Just because in things like grocery, in things like a lot of HBA, in things like cleaning supplies, you have to do a lot of business there to squeeze out a margin. We talk about it all the time. Grocery margins are razor thin, and that's even before you're paying for all this shipping. So... Again, I think it was just the margins that ended up getting them in the end. Sometimes you run out of money. Sometimes you figure out a concept becomes untenable. That being said, we enjoyed the brandless concept when it was around. I was a regular brandless customer myself, so I will miss that. But again, you see more consolidation in the e-commerce grocery space, the e-commerce, if you want to call it cleaning product space, if you will. There are other brands out there. Public Goods, for example, they charge a little bit more for their products, but Again, time will tell because we don't get to see any of the balance sheets from these privately held companies, and I'm not completely sure that a lot of them are sustainable. I think what you're going to start to see over the next five years is what we talked about earlier in the show with the meal prep kit service. You're going to see increased consolidation, and you're going to see buyouts in this category. Not necessarily a bad thing for the brands or the brand's founders because they get a chance to cash in on that. Also, the VC companies do. But at the same time, it's not a space that is set up for a high amount of competition amongst different brands because of the volume that one brand has to do in order to be sustainable. As always, we may have a position in or against companies we discuss on the podcast. Do not invest in stocks solely on the input of the podcast hosts. We've reached the final segment of the Retail Focus podcast, a segment we always call Looking Ahead, where each Leighton and I take a look at a story we're keeping an eye on for the next week, month, or perhaps year. And Leighton, I understand you're turning to the convenience store space this week. That's right, Trent. With a lot of news about how convenience stores are trying to evolve in the current landscape, we had a story recently about 7-Eleven. We've had a lot of stories recently about how there is a massive amount of competition in the space, not only just to be in a new market maybe and produce maybe increasing gains for their investors, but also the hot and ready meal prep that is very large in the convenience store space. And one of the companies that lead that space now 
is called Quick Trip, which is a convenience store company that is privately owned and is an American chain of convenience stores that's actually headquartered in Tulsa, Oklahoma. They operate around 800 stores throughout the United States. So a lot of people may not be aware of them because there are maybe several thousand 7-Elevens around and other convenience stores as well that are maybe more prolific throughout the United States and that have a longer stated history. And because of that, Quick Trip really has taken a backseat in terms of major media outlets picking up news stories about them. And they opened in 1958, for those wondering, the first Quick Trip did. And throughout that history, they've been very steadfast with the idea that they should only grow regionally. They should only grow within the markets, the immediate markets that they've been serving for the most recent past. So they have a number of locations in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, for example, but they've been slowly extending out over the past to new markets. And we're talking not only new cities, but also new states. So here we have news recently of a first Quick Trip store opening in San Antonio, and then also maybe some news of a Quick Trip to enter the Denver market for the first time. And so with that, Quick Trip has announced plans that they should be opening in Alabama by 2021, by summer or fall of 2021. And according to those close to the situation, barring any regulatory hurdles from that state or those municipalities there in Tuscaloosa, at least, that the Quick Trip should come to fruition. And this is an interesting trend because this is a company that is very calculated in where they grow. You and I were both around Quick Trips growing up, and we saw that they are very, very knowledgeable about those immediate areas in which they grow or redevelop current locations. This means they've done their homework in Alabama, and this means that they see an absolute opportunity to grow in a new market, and they see that maybe that current market there, those different cities within Alabama, are currently being underserved by what's there in the convenience store space right now. What's interesting to me, Trent, is how fast they've grown over the last several years. And even more to that point, we can't really see too much into their financials. We get sort of an overarching idea of what their revenue may be, maybe around $12 billion a year, but we don't really know too terribly much because they are, again, a privately held institution. And so, we do know that they, again, are very careful in due diligence and they are strong in the idea that they should reinvest constantly into their business and grow carefully, but make sure that the moves they make are there for the long-term investment aspect of the business. So for instance, there were several locations that we grew up around that would often close and then reemerge as a new facility, but they would do that a lot. They would do that a lot once they have faith in a particular market and gain brand momentum. And so you see now a lot of the markets that Quick Trip is in, it's really just a few players in town now because Quick Trip has such a massive local following. And I think this is going to be interesting to see how not only this works out in Alabama, in the state of Alabama, but if they're eyeing other communities, other regions throughout the country that are going to be excited to maybe have the Quick Trip brand serve them. I know, at least in Orange County and Los Angeles County, where I live now, it really is an interesting space. The convenience store space is one that is hyper competitive, but there is not a quality convenience store that you get like Quick Trip. For those unfamiliar with the brand, they are extremely clean and transparent locations. Pricing is clear. You know what to expect with Quick Trip. And like I said at the beginning of this looking ahead story, Trent, their ready to serve meals have just taken a massive chunk of market share from those other local QSRs because people in the morning not only get coffee, but they now get their breakfast meals from an establishment like Quick Trip. Yeah, and just to provide a little bit of color on what Leighton was talking about with Quick Trip's expansion to Alabama, which is what we'll be keeping an eye on, but also that Denver expansion, which for us Colorado residents can't come soon enough because most of our convenience stores out here are, uh, I, I think I would be fair to say, garbage. But you look at Quick Trip, you have a cult following there. When they announced their openings in San Antonio, people were almost shooting off fireworks and that type of thing. So very similar to what you see from certain chains on the East Coast, from certain chains in the upper Midwest with that cult following. That's what you've got with Quick Trip, and they're looking to enter the Alabama market, hoping to pull in some of that cult following as well. 
I had a lot of things that I was kind of debating over for my looking ahead story. There was an article in Bloomberg this week about Amazon's new grocery store in California. And there were a few other articles that were kind of floating around for interesting stories. But ultimately, at the end of the day, I went back to one of my favorite things. And that's beer. Anyone who's listened to the podcast at all knows that I rather enjoy beer. And this week, Molson Coors released their recent earnings call. Now, we don't really cover Molson Coors a lot on the show as we would on the now defunct Food Focus podcast. But the reason I'm looking ahead for Molson Coors has to do with retail shelf space. So this last quarter, they actually saw net sales per hectoliter, which is a metric that they use, basically how much money you're bringing in per, say, hectoliter of beer, per, you know, if you want to think about it that way, gallon of beer. Net sales per volume of beer increased 2.4% over last year. And actually, on a constant currency basis, it was 2.9% over the fourth quarter last year. Why did this happen? Well, it's not because the company is charging more for Molson or Coors Light. It's because they are continuing to focus on making their portfolio a premium one, or as they say, premiumizing their portfolio. They have said that overall, they are pouring a lot more resources, a lot more support into the what are considered micro brews or maybe more craft brands. To that point, they actually recently just purchased a craft brand out of Michigan. But more importantly, it's going to be up to Molson Coors to optimize their shelf space in stores. Shelf space, especially in the beer segment, is very, very competitive. And it's really at an all-time competition level when you look at just the level of craft brews that are out there, especially now on a more local basis. It's going to be up to Molson Coors to have an open dialogue to these retailers with Molson Coors' own merchandisers that are coming in, setting the mix, making sure that they get some of these products that they own. Hop Valley Brewing Company is one of them that they've purchased, but there are several others that they hold within their portfolio, making sure that they get ample space for them in coolers in non-local areas. Overall, that's what I'm going to be looking ahead at is as Molson Coors, as InBev, as these major companies begin to dip more into craft beer, begin to buy up more of these craft brewing companies that we've seen time and again happen over the last three to five years, how will shelf space change in retailers? How will displays change in retailers? And yet we've seen that here in Colorado simply because the craft beer revolution, you could make an argument that it started among other places in Colorado, but how is it going to change in most of the country when you still have these macro beers that are being consumed on a very large basis? Can Molson Coors and other companies successfully shift the focus of consumers to the more premium brands and get them to maybe drop a little bit more money per hectoliter, which is certainly something that they're looking at happening? Well, at least Molson Coors is pouring a lot more money into that for the coming year, and they released expectations for 2020. They expect their craft volume to just continue to increase. In fact, if you look just in the U.S., They're managing to increase net sales by a larger margin than the rest of the craft industry just within their own craft brand. So something to just keep an eye on there going ahead. Well, that'll do it for us here on the Retail Focus podcast. For Leighton, I'm Trent saying so long until next week. A big thanks to Shlomo Chop and Ryan Wolf of Shop Fulfill. Next week, our interview guest will be discussing 360 photography for e-commerce websites the mechanisms behind executing that photography, but also the logistics of getting that photography onto the website of major, major retailers throughout the U.S. So I hope you tune in for that. We're looking forward to it, and we'll be back seven days from now. This has been the Retail Focus Podcast. For more, visit our website at retailfocuspodcast.com and subscribe on iTunes or Stitcher. Follow us on Twitter at Retail Podcast.